Good morning. This is Meg Riley in sunny, hot Minneapolis where summer has arrived. Great to see everybody. I'm excited about our special guests today. But first, let's say hello to the hosts. Aisha, good morning out there early. I think you're holding good, down the West Coast today. Good morning. Yes. Uh, bright and early. It's about four in the morning here. No, it's only eight in the morning. I'm just being a baby. Uh, it's Aisha Hauser. I'm in Seattle and it is sunny, super bright and sunny this morning. So I was actually up at like 630 um, and I'm doing well. Christina, how are you? Hi, everybody. This is Christina Rivera. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where last night I was blessed to see Rodrigo y Gabriela, and they were superb. It was like a blessing from on high. It was exactly what was needed, and they actually managed to get like all of white Charlottesville on their feet, which is like amazing. Um, I was a little bummed that I hadn't thought before that to try and make sure that there was more of a mixed crowd there, but those of us that were there were just loving it. So very excited to be with you all today. Still have some of that energy in me. <laughs> Michael Tino, how you doing? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino in Peekskill, New York. Um, I'm doing okay. Uh, I, it's, it's a really good thing I remembered this morning that it was Thursday, uh, mostly because my six-year-old, when she crawled into bed, went, Daddy, it's Thursday today? Um, I don't know why it was like, you know, the Holy Spirit was moving through my six-year-old to remind me that it was Thursday because I basically took the day off yesterday to hang out with a dear, dear friend who was visiting. And, um, it was, it was what I needed to do, but it meant, meant that Wednesday kind of disappeared. So other, I would have woken up and thought it was Wednesday and you wouldn't have seen me and y'all have been texting me. So it's good to be with you. So I'll go next. Hi, Margaret Lee, coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. And no, it is not, last week, I think I said it was cold. It's not at all. It is sunny, but very nice weather. Um, and as you know, I will be looking for your questions and comments on Facebook. So everybody here knows what you're thinking and what kind of questions you have. All right, I'm going to send it back to you, Meg. Thanks a lot. So before we get to our special guests uh, from Black Lives of UU, we always do kind of a little roundup of what's up in the UU world. And I'll start by just saying um, a lot of people are having annual meetings right now. A lot of congregations either just had them or they're having them. And so I just wanted to shout out with wishes for generosity and courage and really living our values, especially relating to our budgets, because you know, as we've said, one of the hallmarks of white supremacy is to get way more tied up with property than with humanity. And it's a really important thing to remember that our mission is not to steward property and wealth. It's actually to have a mission. So if you are looking for courage in that meeting, we wanted to give you some to speak the truth, to lead with love. And may all of our congregations find their way. That's, that's my little tiny sermon for the morning. And, you know, I think it can't be said too often that the budgets that we make and pass are moral documents, right? So um, how, how we fund things and who we fund and how we pay people fair compensation and benefits um, are expressions of our moral values. And if we're not, if those aren't aligned with the principles, principles we claim, something's wrong. And we, we're talking about maybe doing a show on endowments someday, because I'm a believer in endowments. I think that they're there to use when you need them. And I, I noticed that the wealthier congregations are, the less willing they are to spend their endowments, which may be how they got wealthy. It's certainly how individuals get wealthy is through holding on to what they have. But mm -hmm. I, I love it when our congregations model something else and model generosity and courage. And I know it's hard. I know these are tough times for a lot of people, but we're... You use are not at the top of the list of people having tough times. So it's a time to really look around and see what the world's calling us to be and do. So, so here's a shout out for courage and generosity. What else is going on? So I want to hold up uh, that the summer issues of UU World are arriving in people's mailboxes right now. And there is an entire section of, uh, of the summer show. I haven't seen it in print, um, but I've seen it online um, called We're Still Here. 
uh, edited by Teresa Soto um, and featuring articles by uh, transgender, uh, genderqueer and non-binary UUs. And um, the ones I've read so far, I haven't read all of them yet, have just been like really just stupendous pieces of work and really a great um, balance uh, and and good on the UU world for for actually following through with conversations with trust and and just turning over print space um, to folks to describe their own experiences and their own lives. That's great. I haven't seen that yet. There's also I know in there an article about Church and Larger Fellowship because it's our 75th anniversary. Uh, we started as an outreach to World War II soldiers. And uh, a sidebar about Worthy Now, our prison ministry. So I'm excited to see it, but I seem to get it a lot later than others. I've got to search it down on, online and see it. So I'm can I give a shout out to CLF? I have a couple of my congregation that are in their 90s, that in the 50s lived in Saudi Arabia. And once, I want to, I don't know if it's once a month or once a quarter, they would get a packet from the Church of the Larger Fellowship and it, they loved it. And they still talk about it. Um, so yay, Church of Larger Fellowship. Give money to the Church of Larger Fellowship, even if you're not a member, or join. And especially if you watch The View. Thank you for that, unsolicited. <laughs> but always grateful for it. Well, anything else in the world of UUism that anyone wants to talk about in these early June days? I know a lot of religious professionals are a little crunchy this time of year. So Wait, is it June? We have not, left not like the never-ending month. We've left the never-ending month. I'm like, <laughs> it's June. <laughs> it happened. And now we have 7,000 days until General Assembly, and then General Assembly is 4,000 days. So that's going to be fun. Or, I'm not fried at all. Look at my hair. Look at my hair. No. <laughs> it used to be days, great. Two days to do 7,000 things before General Assembly. <laughs> it's more like it, yeah. Interesting. We're going to do a show at General Assembly. It'll be on Friday morning. Well, Friday early afternoon, if you're out east, because we will all be on West Coast time joining Asia Hauser for that one. It'll be Friday at 11 Pacific time, which is 2 Eastern time. And we'll let you know more about that. We always just like to talk to people who are at General Assembly. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing people. Michael, I know you won't be there, but I think the rest of us will be. I will not. I will be representing the view, among others, at the, the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall uprising in New York City. I've heard Grace Jones is going to be in New York City at the Pride. I'll be hanging out with Grace Jones. So I there mean, we go. I'm a little bit jealous. I, <laughs> I just say, yeah, many of us miss Pride year after year because of General Assembly. One year it was early and we could come home and go, but usually, yeah, it's a, it's a sad. The sad thing that it overlaps that way. Anyway, we're really excited today to welcome two of the collective from the Black Lives of UU, Reverend Michael Slack, who is the Community Minister for Worship and Spiritual Care, and Dr. Takia Noor Amin, who is the Content Director for Blue. Welcome to both of you, and we're really excited, especially those of us in Minneapolis, about the upcoming uh, symposium on Black theology. So let's start by talking about that. Isn't Minneapolis great? No, that isn't what you want to talk about. <laughs> well, I'm sure Minneapolis is wonderful. Um, and we're excited to be in St. Paul. I think it's um, good because Lena uh, will have to travel and she'll be there right. by then. So that's anyway, right. That's right. what um, but yeah. about? Uh, we're excited to be um, in, in St. Paul, October 30th through November 2nd uh, for Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the Harper Jordan Memorial Symposium, um, which will be an opportunity to um, to really dive deep uh, into an understanding of of Unitarian Universalism that centers blackness, right? That is unapologetically black and that um, lives and breathes from our co-creation and co-development. So it's going to be a pretty magical experience, I think. Um, uh, we're going to be at the Intercontinental uh, Hotel in St. Paul. Um, St. Paul Riverfront. It's going to be four days of, of really incredible opportunities to learn uh, and grow together, um, just be in community together, eat together, all the things that we do um, when we're together at Blue. 
um, this is going to be a chance to do that uh, in a very particular and, and special way. Um, and it's also the first time that we're going to be hosting an event that is uh, open to all. Um, we're certainly prioritizing um, Black folks and Indigenous folks and people of color in the registration, um, but it is open to everyone. And so, so we're looking forward to that too. It'll be a different, it'll be a different experience, and and I think we'll bring all of the things that we tend to bring to our gatherings. So, it's it's good stuff. Fantastic. Can you describe some of what the program will be? Yeah. Um, I want to say first that we're really excited about the symposium. And part of why it's a symposium and not a conference is because typically conferences have breakout sessions or individual tracks. And we thought that it was um, really important for this inaugural event um, for ha to have all of the attendees moving through the learning experience together, right? So a symposium, unlike a conference, is composed of multiple plenary sessions. We will have six plenary sessions built around a set of themes where all will be in attendance at each of them together, learning, growing, and having an opportunity to um, engage the invited guest speakers and panelists in dialogue and conversation so that we might continue um, thinking through and articulating a vision for a, a, a Black Unitarian Universalist um, theology that is co-created and co-developed as Reverend Michael mentioned. It's not sort of blue as the organizing collective um, telling anybody what Black UU theology is, but rather that we would gather as a community and articulate that um, out of this shared opportunity for learning and for dialogue and engagement. So we're really excited about this. Blue has done large scale events before. We hosted the you know, first Black UU convening in New Orleans in 2017. We've had a Black UU revival. Um, and we're really excited about the symposium as sort of the end of what we conceptualized for 2019 as a theology year. We've been doing events to think about Black UU theology since January of this year. Some of you may have been around on Facebook for our Whose Faith Is It Anyway panel. Um, we've also been having in the explicitly Black closed blue Facebook group, what we call community conversations once a month that have been around each of the seven principles that Blue began to articulate in 2015. If you missed any of that or you're not in the closed group, that's just fine. All you have to do is head on over to Blue's YouTube channel and the recording of the Who's Faith panel is there as well as um, edited versions of those community conversations. So we've really been thinking and talking about what does it mean to be both Black and Unitarian Universalist at the same time? Um, as a lived experience and faith perspective. Part of why that feels really important, and I know we'll get to this a little bit later, is because, you know, for a while it seemed like the prevailing wisdom was one had to be either Black or you, you. And that you could not somehow live a full, rich, embodied reality as both at the same time. And I think that a lot of the work that Blue has been doing since its inception has really been pushing back on that. So the symposium gives us an opportunity to do that together in a shared sort of short-term learning community. There will be six plenary sessions ranging from UU contextual history to systematic theology, to hearing from folks who've tried to start intentional communities um, in Unitarian Universalism that were either explicitly Black or explicitly POC communities and what those experiences were. We're also going to have an opportunity to hear from folks in other faith traditions about what does it mean to be both separate and together. So what does it mean to be in a mainstream faith community like the Methodist Church, for example, where you are a part of a larger body of Methodists from a range of racial and ethnic backgrounds, but to also have congregations that are committed to um, propagating and celebrating sort of black life and culture as a centerpiece of the way that they do faith practice. Um, I should say too, you know, we've been doing a lot of work and thinking about this planning and I can say on behalf of the team that we're really excited and confident about it, but we're also just 
felt to think about the ways in which spirit might show up and move in that space in ways that it never has before. So every time we sit down to plan it, I think to myself, I want to go to this. And then I'm reminded that I get to be there. So it's great. I'm glad you want to go to it. Will there be worship along with the plenaries or is it really plenaries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will yeah, be. Um, we're very yeah. excited about worship. I'm going to give this to Reverend Michael. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to have worship. Um, we're excited that there's going to be a special worship team um, there for the entirety of our gathering. And their primary purpose is to pay attention, to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the space. Um, to what we're learning together on site, um, how folks are communicating and talking to one another, um, the music that will are, are that's that's that are being called to mind. Um, all of that is going to go into the development of a worship service that will happen on Saturday. So uh, you know, this would be very different from typical worship planning, right? In the sense that we're not going to know whether or not there's going to be a sermon. Maybe there won't be. Um, we're not going to be sure what that what that experience is going to be like, because it is going to come directly out of the experience that weekend, um, which is really dynamic um, and different um, and something that we're really looking forward to. Um, we're, I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the announcement to come out for all of, all the amazing people um, who are gonna be on the worship team. That is so exciting. How many people are you thinking will be there? A couple hundred or I have no idea, a hundred? Well, our, our hope is to, to fill the place, uh, which would be 150 people uh, all together. Um, I, I think in terms of participation, uh, folks who are participating on the plenaries themselves, there are I think around 23 people um, all together who are participating on the plenaries. Um, all, all the organizing collective board of directors for Blue uh, staff uh, who are gonna be working the event and all the attendees, all of those folks together should should, if we reach our goal, which I, I'm imagining we will, I will be 150 folks. I cannot imagine you won't. It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mm -hmm. just want to chime in here too and, and make clear that when we say everybody is welcome to register and attend, we really do mean everybody. Um, theology is not just for ministers or people who identify publicly as theologians or seminarians. Um, if you are interested in the intersection of what it means to be black and you, you that, ha that has to say about implications for living out this shared living tradition, we want you in the room. Um, you don't have to be a religious professional. You don't have to be an aspiring religious professional. We want people there who are interested in attending. So, you know, this is not some event just for people with titles or degrees or credentials. I also want to say, you know, this is the first big event that Blue is doing that isn't explicitly Black, and I know people might be wondering why that is. And for us, it was pretty simple um, in that Black theology is as relevant to people. Um, the same way that we think about the history of African-descended people as being a part of global history, the same way that the legacy and heritage of African-Americans is essential to American history, the same way that we um, are beginning, I think, to think even more deeply and fully about how Black people have helped to shape Unitarianism, Universalism, and Unitarian Universalism, that should be relevant to anybody who claims this as this faith, this practice, as their living tradition. So it seemed important to um, welcome anybody into the space who was committed to and interested in that vision. At the same time, we will have a lounge explicitly Black space at the hotel for Black folks who feel they need to um, maybe take a break away from the larger group at any point for grounding and support. We understand how important those healing spaces are, so we'll be sure to have that available. But it felt really important and natural to be at a place where we were having this conversation more by more fully. Well, I will just say how grateful I am about that. Having attended the online symposium, that was one of the most exciting theological symposiums. Well, I don't know if you call that a symposium. It was a panel. It was amazing though. I, I mean, I, I, I've watched it three times. I could preach on it every week. It, it, so I feel like, yes, I, I'm really delighted that it's open to everyone. And 
Mm -hmm. Thanks for explaining it because I didn't want to send her whiteness yeah. and ask right away. <laughs> so I was like, you wait, mm -hmm. ask that later. But let's talk about what you think is unique, what Black theology uh, brings to our movement. It has brought, brings, and will mm -hmm. bring. How do you see? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, think, I think that's Go a ahead. good question. I, I want to say first that um, one of the things that I think is really important to lift up is um, if you are a member of the youth congregation, right? I've been in five different congregations in life, and many of them you go in and there's a UU 101 or, you know, some kind of what is Unitarian Universalism class or offering that shared, right? And one of the things that always struck me is that very, I can't think of any time in my life in this space where the contributions or lived experiences of Black people in Unitarianism, Universalism, or Unitarian Universalism was actually lifted up in those spaces, right? And so it creates this kind of vacuum um, that I think suggests the notion, and I've said this before, that Unitarian Universalism is sort of like the good white people's religion, and Black folks in particular, and all POCI, people of color and indigenous folks in general, are guests here. And we should just be so glad that the good white people let us come into their nice liberal religion. And that doesn't make any sense and it's not historically accurate. So part of it is about lifting up the ways in which black people have enriched this faith tradition with their lives, right? It's a people's theology. It's a theology that emerges from the lived experience of black people within these traditions. So sometimes when I'm with well-meaning white folks and they say, you know, well, who's the black Emerson? You know, or who's the, you know, looking for sort of analogous thinkers? Um, that's already the wrong question in terms of how it recenters whiteness. But also, I think if you're looking for the evidence of black theology in these traditions, you have to look at the lives of black people who have lived in these traditions and what they did with their lives and what that tells us about the values, the commitments, um, the, the contours of, of this theology. So the symposium is gonna give us an opportunity to, to dig into that more deeply and more fully. And that's something that we're really excited about. Michael, did you have a thought to share? Yes, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity for us to really look at, um, you know, I, I like to think of, about theology um, in, in four different ways, right? Um, any sort of study of theology uh, talks about four, four main primary things, right? Uh, ethics, right? Um, um, it also talks about sort of ecclesiology, right? Like how we show up in, in worship spaces. What does our liturgy look like? Uh, what music are we playing? Um, we're also thinking about pastoral pastoral theology, right? What does the the care and keeping of souls look like? Um, and and the fourth is is uh, this really fun this really fun and funny word that I love um, called missiology, which is really about like mission and and what does evangelism look like and how do you understand connecting with other people around your faith um, and bringing people into this space that feels joyful um, and loving and powerful and and helps you understand how to live in the world. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and 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 I think a black UU theology um, infuses and centers blackness in all of these conversations in a way that, quite frankly, in in the vast majority of the brick and mortar uh, congregations that I'm aware of, those conversations don't even happen on any level, um, much less uh, in a way that actually centers blackness. Um, and so I'm excited for us to do that, uh, you know, in in in. Uh, in person, like on, the, like actually doing it, right? Um, I've talked a, a little bit about the difference between being Unitarian Universalist and talking about Unitarian Universalism. And for me, those two things are often very separate. Like we, we, I find a lot of folks are talking, can talk about Unitarian Universalism. I can't tell you how many folks can, can recite the seven principles to me. Um, and then I ask, well, how, in your life, how does what does it mean to live out those principles? And that is a much harder conversation. Um, and I don't think it's a hard conversation because it's hard to do, honestly. I think it's a hard conversation because we haven't gotten into uh, the flow of what it means uh, to really understand how we're living out our faith. Um, and so that feels like a real big distinction 
um, that I hope we can really uh, join people in, in journeying through. What I really appreciate about how um, Blue has been ministering uh, and centering Blackness is <clears throat> it expands our imagination to what Unitarian Universalism is, right? We are the, the living tradition and revelation is not sealed. And I think the way it's been embodied, um, the way I've experienced it be embodied, especially in bl brick and mortar, regardless if I'm the religious educator, is um, centered on, sure, we can intellectually understand what discomfort is, but we don't really want it in our bodies. Like, what does it mean to embody Unitarian Universalism and to live Unitarian Universalism? And that is what I have experienced Blue um, just living. And to me, that's what just expanded my imagination. And I think I think as a society, we suffer, U US societies, we suffer from a lack of imagination. It's just been a, a gift. Um, your, I would, I would uh, steer folks to the blue agreements that are on your webpage about how you all work together as the organizing collective. I also want to just interrupt for two seconds. Latanya Broom has been named the director of General Assembly. I don't know what the official title is, but she's on and we forgot to name that in the roundup. So uh, she is a member of blue, an amazing black woman. Yay, Latanya. And I just want to say congratulations. So back to blue, uh, back to regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> Well, we're getting a lot of comments, so I'll just uh, throw a few more of them in. Uh, Everett Renee Harvey Thompson from Side with Love says, yay for emergent design for faith and liberation. Yes, um, we have people excited about coming and wondering if there will be a scholarship fund for this. I can speak to that. Um, we don't have a scholarship fund for the event, but we do have registration available on a sliding scale. Um, one of the reasons why uh, people might know that Blue won't be in full force at General Assembly this year is because we are focused on um, building out our organizational infrastructure and also directing resources towards the symposium in October. So if you head on over to our website where the details for the symposium live, you will see that you can register for a sliding scale um, based on your own need. And we are encouraging people, if you are connected to a congregation, a seminary, a school, any sort of you, you or faith related entity to really think about um, tapping into resources at that institution to support your registration or coming to the symposium. We also know that there are folks who can't come, but who are interested in maybe sponsoring someone there is an opportunity for you to do that as well if you're um, if you'd like to do that if you know someone you'd like to sponsor their registration or you want to connect with us to make sure you are donating resources for people to attend you know we'd love to have folks in the room and we really don't want cost to be a barrier there if you do feel that you have absolutely no resources available to you to register you can still register at a zero dollar rate and we will do all that we can to try to fill that gap, but what we need to be clear about is, even if you register at the full rate, which is $150 for the event, that still only covers some costs. We have to take care of all the audio visual and details at the hotel, as well as the meals that we'll be providing that week. Um, so it is important that if you can pay, that you do pay, but that if you can't, you um, are willing to tap into other resources perhaps to subsidize your participation because we really like folks to, to be there. When we say everybody, we mean everybody. So we're always looking for ways to try to make events like this as accessible as possible. And sometimes you know, the specter of capitalism can make that difficult when you're trying to host events like this, but we are always endeavoring to create ways for connection and engagement and we'll continue to do so with all of our in-person large scale events. And just to say the obvious, that those of us who are white and have salaries will want to be generous as we register and also thinking about helping out other people with less resources. So, um, mm -hmm. so can you tell me about the blue agreements? I feel ignorant about them. And I see <laughs> Catherine Clarenbach cheering for them. And it makes me think I'll go look, but can you say what they yeah. are? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So what you want to do is if you go to Blue's website and you scroll mm -hmm. all the way to the bottom, you'll see a link to our working agreements. 
Um, and I want to say, you know, sort of with my, my chest poked out here on behalf of the team, we're actually really proud of our working agreements. Um, it took, oh, I don't know, six months maybe. It took and, a little longer than six months, but yeah. Yeah, a little more than six months. We really, um, as the organizing collective board, spent time on every single section and every single word in those agreements to really, it really lays out how we've decided to work together. Um, it's interesting because I've had speaking engagements in other spaces where people are beginning to reference the working agreements. They've been using them to um, form the basis for agreements for small group ministries. Um, there are other organizations that are looking at our working agreements as a model for how, we're, how the group they've assembled is going to work together. And the exciting thing for us about our working agreements is that because we were so prayerful and careful about crafting them, when we're together, we don't have to spend time talking about how we're going to work because we've already decided how we're going to work together, which means that when we gather to work, we can kind of dive right into the tasks we need to accomplish because we've already worked out how we manage conflict or what we're going to do if someone needs to leave the space. Like all of that is laid out in our working agreements. And for us, it really is grounded in our faith as Unitarian Universalists. You know, we talk a lot amongst ourselves about Unitarian Universalism as a covenantal faith, a faith that the evidence of which arises in the quality and um, evidence of our relationships with each other, not as a confessional faith grounded in um, what we profess about what we believe. And so how we choose to engage each other relationally seems essential to living out Unitarian Universalism for us as Black UUs. It's a part of sort of emerging theology there that's being articulated. And um, yeah, we're really proud of those working agreements. Michael, you wanna chime in? Yeah, and you know, I've I've had folks ask me, "Do you? I, that's a that's a rather lengthy document. Do you guys actually refer to them?" And we actually do. Um, we actually do. And and also, what came out of the development of those working agreements were some staff working agreements um, that are that are very similar. And we actually uh, focus in on on those specific agree on one of those each month um, as a staff team. So. Um, so they are, they get weaved uh, in and through all of our work and how we live and how we interact with each other. And, and it's funny, I have found myself getting really, really, really frustrated, deeply frustrated, um, and even angered at times when I'm in other spaces that don't have those kinds of working agreements, because the experience is, is very, very different. Um, the folks are way more willing to be, you know, defensiveness comes really easily. Um, um, a, a lot of distress and disagreement comes really easily, but because we have, have really figured out and took the time to, to hear from everybody about what it means for us to really be doing this together and being this together, um, because we took that time, it, it makes a huge difference in how much work we can get done. Um, and, and, and honestly, the extent to which we're able to vision um, into the future. Uh, we're really, because we're not bogged down by all of those things. Uh, those other things in the moment. They're, pre they're very, very powerful. Thank you. I'm really excited to go study them. <laughs> Christina. Um, uh, you all talked a little bit at the beginning about who should come um, to the symposium. And I'm just wondering about um, uh, if there's any kind of tracks online for families or for multi-generational or for youth, or if you could talk a little bit about about that aspect of it that makes me so excited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I believe Takia uh, touched on this a little bit near the beginning, um, because it is a symposium format, um, we're all kind of going to be together um, in space, uh, learning all of the same things. Um, and so, and we're excited for family, uh, for folks with, uh, with kiddos to join us uh, of any age. Um, what we are doing as part of our registration is getting a clearer sense of how many folks are planning to bring children. Um, and once we know that closer to the event, we're gonna make sure that there is space um, and to create some opportunities for childcare and other learning um, that, is, that is aligned with the kinds of things that folks are gonna be doing in that one big room together. Um, so, so we're sort of taking that information in right now and figuring out what that needs to look like moving forward. 
because we were aware of the fact and from the beginning we were aware that because of the nature of the event folks may not may not want to bring their kids but we really hope that if folks are excited about bringing their kids that they should um and and we'll make sure that that there's there's really amazing space for for folks one of the things that also feels important to lift up is um <laughs> You know, when I've brought Black folks to UU congregations with me who were unfamiliar with our faith tradition, they always have a lot of questions about how we engage with children and youth and our young people because they tend to see us sending them away a lot, right? And that has made people, in my experience, feel everything from sort of amused to terrified, like, where are the That's children right. going? That's right. But also this idea of, you know, how do people learn what it is to be an adult in this faith if there's not a lot of time for intergenerational engagement? And so part of what I'm hoping will be modeled in the symposium for kids and youth who might be present is what does it mean to participate in an event like this? You know, what is it to show up? to listen, to engage in dialogue, to take notes, to co-create. Um, I think about my own growing up and how my mother, who was an educator, would often take myself and my siblings to community events, often because she didn't have anybody to watch us, but also because she wanted us to see what it was to be engaged in community at that level, what it meant to be sitting at the table and sharing your thoughts and ideas and voices in that dialogue. So. We do welcome folks to bring their kids. We do welcome folks to register and bring youth if they would like to. And we'll make sure that there are resources and appropriate programming for that. This is Mara Gilly. I just want to say I am going. I'm excited to be going. <laughs> and then I, I wanted to also add, you know, I, I know I'm going to be volunteering at a to provide pastoral care. But I also want, you know, I, I do, um, as you can see, production support. So I'm gonna contact Paige and see if she wants help in that area. But, and the other thing I wanted to add is I have been to uh, uh, blues the Blues Revival. That was something, to be in blue space where, um, you know, you're doing worship service. It, it's just an amazing thing. I mean, I remember feeling it all over my body. You know, your your whole body feels it, and um, so it really. And so I'm looking because of that, because I've had that experience. I'm looking forward to the symposium to be in that space again. So, well, you know, one of the things that we've been sensitive about. Well, let me just say first, Margaret, we're thrilled you're coming. Where it's going to be great to see your smile in person. Um, you too, Asha. Yes, Aisha, our first registrant, by the way. I was the first <laughs> registrant. I want that written down somewhere. I want a plaque. She I wants want a certificate. <laughs> Give her that. <laughs> but you know, one of the things that we've been sensitive about since the beginning of this is, you know, a lot of Black UUs have family that are not Black. And, and we're aware of that. There are Black folks, you know, who are committed to the work of justice and the work of Blue who have white spouses, who have... Uh, multiracial families and we're we're sensitive to that we're aware of that and while sometimes there is a critical need for explicitly black space which we don't apologize for and which we are still dedicated to and committed to this might be a great opportunity if you are black and have experienced blue space to bring your family that isn't black to experience, you know, some of the joy and excitement that shows up when we're in blue community together. And also if you are black and you have um, thought about whether or not blue was a space for you to engage or what a large scale in-person event would be like, this is gonna be a really great opportunity to come and get a sense of what blue is. If you've just sort of been hearing about blue and you wonder what we're like in person or what happens at our events, um, this is a great opportunity to come and be engaged and to really get accurate information about, about Blue um, in an embodied and in a real way. Embodiment is coming up for me a lot. I should say too, I also have a piece in the UU world that just came out that's showing up in people's mailboxes right now all about dance and worship and embodiment. Um, so this is a, I'm thinking about that a lot because the symposium is going to create not only a wonderful opportunity for us to have sort of shared embodied worship on Saturday, but also to be um, um, communally engaged in our learning and model what that looks like, I think at a really high level 
without it being just for academics or religious professionals. So it's going to be an exciting time. Yeah, we all we all have something to say about how we live out our faith. We all have something to say. And so I'm excited for folks to to let us know and to be in it. It's going to be great. So I love the deliberateness and the strategic way that Blue does its work. Michael, as you said, most congregations aren't thinking at all about what it means to be theologically grounded, much less incorporating Black perspectives in that. Just not thinking from any perspective beyond things like how to not spend the endowment and stuff. So <laughs> back to my original thing. So I'm really curious what you think this, how this space inviting in everybody will feel, um, will fuel movement going forward because you're talking about creating a space that has some radical differences from the spaces we are generally in. And I've seen from the symposium, well, Asia's case in point, the revolution that comes out of that different experience, you know? And so I'm just curious to dream big on it, uh, which I know you're both really good at. Like, what, what would you envision the revolution might happen from um, all kinds of people experiencing that space together? Right. I mean, on, <clears throat> on, on one level, I, I think um, we're talking about um, believing in the possibility of things beyond what you ordinarily see and understand, right? Um, we're talking about possibility. Uh, often folks show up um, in UU spaces and get handed a thing. This is who we are. This is how we do what we do. I hope you can figure out how to make that work for you. And this is very different. Um, this, this puts people in a position to actually believe that something beyond what they might get handed is possible um, and that it can actually involve and infuse um, the very contours of their own faith, their own hearts, their own minds. Um, and, and, and that's what I hope at, at, the, at, at a base level <laughs> um, is what I hope happens um, and what I'm expecting will happen. Um, when folks are gathered in St. Paul. Uh, I, I'm, I'm being reminded uh, in this moment of uh, worship at Revival. Um, Margalee, thank you for, for lifting that up. Um, you know, we had a, a worship service that Saturday at Revival um, that had healing stations all over the room, right? Um, there was a, a station for anointing with oil. There was a station for water blessings. There was a station for communion there was a station for meditation and silence. Like there are four or five stations all over the room. Um, and, and every station was filled up, right? Um, and, and just, and walking away from that, you know, leaving that experience, so many folks were like, I just didn't know that it was possible for us, for all of us to actually get all of what we need in one spiritual experience. And it happened. And my goodness, it was two or three hours long and nobody was mad about that, right? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody flinched. Like the last song got played and everybody was still, like nobody was moving. Because we were like, you know, just play more music. Just keep playing the music and folks will get what they need and then we'll leave. And, and so it, just a sense of possibility um, mm -hmm. is something that folks often don't get. And, and we want to, we are going to offer that um, to people. Mm -hmm. I also see what we're doing in opening the doors to symposium as a kind of capacity building. And let me explain what I mean by that. In my experience as a, a UU, and we've heard this echoed from other Black UUs who we've engaged in group community, there is this sense, whether it's articulated or not, that Unitarian Universalism is sort of at its best or at its height when it is expressed in the context of multiracial community, right? There are some people who I know have been um, sort of dubious about the work of Blue or um, disinterested in the work of Blue because to them, the fact that it is, and I'm using the quote fingers here, just black 
means that it's somehow taking something away from the faith in some way. Um, I, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, we, we've had people say, well, you know, it must be boring when you're in blue space because everybody's the same. And it's like, do you know black people? I mean, <laughs> blackness is always already diverse and blackness is always already multicultural. So even when we talk about multiculturalism, we need to kind of trouble those contours all, already. But there's this sense that our faith is only at its best when it is this kind of superficial, um, multiracial, hand-holding, we're all in love with each other, we have no problems, anti-blackness and white supremacy don't exist here. Uh, even if we know it exists here, we're going to leave it uninterrogated. And that that's sort of the best of what we have to offer as a faith. And, 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 and we say no to that. We are saying in a clear way, in a bold way, but also in a rigorous and thoughtful way that Black Unitarian Universalism can, should, uh, can and should and is thriving and exists in the world. And we all need to learn more about it, be aware of it, figure out how we can be conversant with it, even if it's not an identity that we ourselves may choose to claim or proclaim for a range of reasons. Um, I think the symposium it will do some work in helping people develop a different set of muscle around this idea that Unitarian Universalism doesn't have to look like the way it's always looked in their individual experience, right? Um, a lot of times I'll be in UU spaces and people will kind of lift up, you know, our, our faith never split. You know, unlike other Protestant traditions, you know, we never had this break along racial lines. And it's like, well, I don't know how true that really is when we look at it from a range of different historical perspectives. And it's also like, well, so what? Why can't there be multiple expressions of what this faith tradition is? Why can't you have a congregation that is centered in a Black UU theology or a different kind of faith expression? Like, why, why can't we have that and that also be okay alongside everything else that exists in the world? So I think part of what we're doing here is really seeding the ground for our faith to kind of mature a little bit and grow up in terms of our understanding of what beloved community can and should mean. At least that's our hope. Ow, preach. <laughs> and I wanted to add to that, the idea of, of um, being in black space or, any space that we caucus around, I think the damage that has been done to black folks or marginalized groups because of um, the dominant culture, I think there has to be a space where that group is able to pull away and heal itself. I think that is really the only way we can be part of the larger group of the human family to deal with the own um, the damage that was done to us as a result of being of a group that has been oppressed for generations and generations. And, um, and then uh, pretending like this has not happened, that, that there isn't a healing that needs to be done is disingenuous. And, and I think that is the importance of being and spaces um, uh, for black folks or other marginalized groups to move away and heal yourself so that you can really um, feel the, um, that, that, that's, that you are the human being you've always been and that you doing the healing you need to do. And I, I think it is so important. And, and I do have a hard time when, when people don't understand how important that it is to do that work. Um, so I just wanted to add that to what you said. Thank you for that, Margolia. On Facebook are remembering the worship service with love. <laughs> and I love how those things live on, you know, that, that, and what I hear you saying is that once you see something you never knew could exist, it keeps living in you and it keeps growing and and until you see it 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 isn't born 
So I don't want to lose a really practical thing that came by because it's I can't see it anymore. That is that Leslie Mack, who's been very instrumental in founding Blue and is now moving on to the UUA board, and thank you for your service, um, mentioned that miles are needed to donate. If you have extra frequent flyer miles, that uh, those are needed and you can donate them to Blue um, so that other people who can't afford plane fares or could use some help could use those miles. So another way to be supportive. So that was a, a tiny thing after giant ideas. <laughs> it's not tiny to affirm generosity. I mean, I think, and Lori Stone Sartosky name that um, she has a source or a resource for uh, funding to help folks get there who can't afford to get there. And so a generosity of spirit is um, one of the ways we can expand our imaginations as you use, like with endowments. Say that, Aisha. <laughs> you know, I just want to chime in here and say, you know, to that point, one of the things that we've been talking about in Blue is, you know, we've all had the experience of being in these brick and mortar congregations where, you know, someone gives a gift some money falls out the sky and you know these long deliberative dialogues that happen about how we can preserve the building you know how we can preserve the physical structure and you know we understand why that's necessary to some degree but the question has to become you know save the building for who you look at some of these congregations that are you know off the beaten path as my mother would say down in the valley where the green grass grows you can't even see a sign from the street. Folk can't get there on the bus line. The congregation ain't got no bus. They're not going to pick nobody up. I did say ain't got no bus. I did say that. Um, you know, who are we preserving these 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 buildings for? These monuments to 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 what? Um, it strikes me as heartbreaking when resources are made available and there is very little conversation or thinking about pouring into people, about pouring into ministries, about, well, how can we use this resource to, yeah, maybe we need new windows, but can we also put some resources towards the training of our lay people or religious education or supporting the music ministry in some way? I mean, these things that are about expanding our human capacity for, love and engagement and the care and keeping of souls which is what you know increasingly i understand ministry to be about so there's something that seems mm, incongruous about the values that we articulate and then the practices that we enjoin and one thing that i know seems to be emerging a lot in this conversation around black youth theology that we've been having in, in the closed group and in other conversations is a real desire for a kind of integration. And I'm not talking about sort of black and white integration. I'm talking about an integrated life, right? Where how you live in the world and what you espouse about your values are in deep, deep, deep relationship and alignment. You know, I'll ask people, are you Unitarian Universalist or are you Unitarian Universalist on, you know, Sunday between nine and noon? You know, what, it, it, how is this showing up and how you live in the world? Do you stop being Unitarian Universalist the minute you walk into a voting booth? Do you stop being Unitarian Universalist the minute you, you know, enact policies that you know are going to be detrimental to other people within your same faith community, within your same lived experience? Like this, this matters. And so I think part of what we're doing with the symposium and our work this year around theology is really also um, seeding the ground and encouraging people to think more deeply about what it means to have a, a life, a praxis that is grounded and shaped by deep engagement with this living tradition that we are proud to proclaim as Unitarian Universalists. Because without that, what are we doing? You know, my grandmother would say, without that, you know, sound like we just play in church. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good thing. Right. And that, it, and that it's not something <clears throat> that is only meant for ministers or people who 
um, are in some sort of religious profession to hand over to you, that it is possible uh, for, for each of us um, to have a real hand in that and to live that and to make that happen um, in, in our communities and all the ways that, in all the ways that we can do that. Um, and, and that's really about um, you know, expanding our imaginations and understanding what's possible. Well, this is so exciting. You know, the door's always open. You're always welcome back. We love it when Blue comes to the show. You used to come every month and I know you've been too busy, but maybe, you know, maybe leading up to the symposium, we can have a couple more conversations as you finalize who's there. And I don't think you'll be looking for people. I think you'll be fending us off, but you know, <laughs> it's great. Any last words? Because I noticed we're coming to the top of the hour. I would just like to say really, really briefly that we did announce our very first plenary session. We'll be rolling out those announcements over the next few months, but our first plenary, which will be on Black UU contextual history, we will have Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, Reverend Sophia Bedencourt, both from Star King School for the Ministry, and also Dr. Chris Cameron, who is a dear friend and colleague of mine, who's the founder of the African American Intellectual History Society and a scholar of early American history. And we're really excited to have the three of them to kick off the event. Whoa. <laughs> and, the la and the last thing I will say is please, please go register for this. This is gonna be a historic moment um, in all of our lives in Unitarian Universalism. And we want as many people uh, mm -hmm. there as possible to be a part of this, not to witness it, but to be a part of it. Thank you so much for all your work. Thanks to the whole collective. Thank you for the work that you're doing for the whole movement and it's, it's just amazing to imagine where this can go. Next week, we have, uh, we're talking about the men's lecture that just took place in Boston with Colin Boston talking about religious extremism and, and white nationalism and the respondents, Danielle DeBona, Kimberly Hampton, Vanessa Southern, all coming to us next week. So that will be exciting. See you there. Any last words from anyone else? All right, take care. <laughs>